Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, okay. Um, as they stated, that my name is Shendi Tabele. I'm from University of Johannesburg, and I'm doing my first year in Masters in Biotechnology. So I'll be presenting about determination of mycotoxin data exposure among humans in rural areas of Limpopo province using LCMS. Okay, my presentation will cover the following uh, aspect. Well, mycotoxin in simple terms are actually secondary metabolites that are usually produced by various filamentous fungi and they're mainly produced by Fusarium, Aspergillus, and Penicillin. There are actually more than 400 mycotoxins discovered since the 1960s. Uh, mycotoxins mostly affect agricultural products such as maize, sorghum, wheat, rice, and etc. These are actually stable food in South Africa or in the whole world. It has been predicted that approximately 35% of agri agricultural products are contaminated with mycotoxins. And well, one might ask why should mycotoxins should be monitored regularly? Um, okay, as you all can see from this diagram, it's actually, it's actually an agricultural product which has a development of fungi and then this fungi produces mycotoxin which results in the pure quality of food. And when human and animal consume this contaminated food, they actually pose a serious uh, health risk. Okay, on this, on this picture here, it actually been um, published that uh, the Transkai, the Transkai population has been affected by Fusarium B1, in which contributed to the escalation of esophageal, esophageal cancer in humans. And again, um, when animal consume feed, contaminated feeds, they especially uh, Zeralenon, it's uh, it's been okay. It's been found that zeralonin is actually a the chemical structure, if you can see in the middle here, is the chemical structure of mycotoxin. So the chemical structure of zeralonin, it it's it acts as a receptor to 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 the um the dairy product, mostly a uh, female, the the one those that give um those that produce are actually milk, the dairy cows. They usually found uh, aflatoxin M1 and aflatoxin M2. Well, the, toxi the toxicity of mycotoxin on human perspective, it has been uh, on human perspective, it has been discovered that uh, mycotoxin are carcinogenic, which cause cancer, and okay, cause cancer, re reduce the strength of. Uh, immune system, cause damage to the liver, cause, cause damage to the, um, to the kidney, uh, cause mutation, uh, poisonous to nerve, nerve tissues, and genotoxic, which cause, uh, which is cause changes in genetic material. Okay, this chart, it shows the distribution of mycotoxin in African countries. As you all can see on the blue on the blue side is aflatoxin. Aflatoxin has been found contaminated in a lot of countries with 43.75% and followed by fumonism, which is 21.87%. And this data was actually obtained in 2014. So probably by now there is actually a high percentage of these mycotoxins. Okay, the effects of mycotoxin actually lead us to these two disciplinaries, which is food safety and food insecurity. Food safety is actually a scientific discipline describing the handling, storage, and preparation of food to avoid foodborne illnesses. And food security is actually refers to the lack of access to nutrition as food. Well, the aim of the aim of my study is to determine multi-mycotoxin data data exposure among residents of Mosharakoma village. Mosharakoma village is actually located in Limpopo province. 
and my objective is to conduct a social democratic survey to establish the level of micro of awareness of on mycotoxin and their implication as well as food consumption pattern. Secondly, to detect and quantify multiple mycotoxin from daily consumed food and human urine. And lastly, to determine the degree of human exposure to multiple mycotoxins. Okay, um, this area is actually Mutarukoma village in which I sampled uh, maize meal, rice, sorghum, and wheat flour. So in this picture, most yet in the, in the area consists of the small pot of maize. And they actually plant this for human consumption. Okay, this is actually the analysis, the lab analysis. Um, a five gram of made of sample were weighed for extraction, and these samples were analyzed through LCMS, and then the method was validated. Okay, these are my results. On this, on this, on my right side, it represents a chromatogram of OTA, which is ochratoxin. And then on my left side, it represents a matrix mail calibration of OTA. So I use a matrix mail calibration to compensate the effect, uh, the matrix effect on the analysis. Okay, I did uh, three levels in which it was at low, recovery at low, low level, and recovery at medium level. So at low level, uh, it was detected that um, aflatoxin. FB1, which is fumanism B1, and fumanism B2 in SOGAM were not detected, as well as 15AC um, dawn. And then on the second level, which is, um, okay, the samples were actually spiked with 50, 50 PPB. The FB1, FB1, FB2, and 15AC dawn were also not detected in SOGAM. And then at high level, which it was, uh, this, the blank sample was spiked with 100 ppb. So FB2 and 15AC don't were not detected. Okay, my recoveries for maize range from 39 to 96% level. At low level, at medium range from 31 to 103 percent, and at high level range from 33 to 103. And recoveries for sorghum range from. 34 to 1, 110% at low level, and at medium range from 33 to 104, while at high level range from 34 to 136. Okay, this table it actually shows my LOD limit of detection, which is the lowest uh, lowest amount of analyte in a sample that can be detected but not necessarily quantitated. And then on on this Second, on this third column, it shows the limit of quantification in which is the lowest, lowest amount of analyte in a sample that can be that can be quantitatively determined with uh, precision and accuracy. And on the fourth row here is, is the linearity for for maize, and then the side is for sorghum. The continuation, and then to summarize this, to summarize this table, uh, the LOD and LOQ values for 21 mycotoxin in maize range from 0 0.01 to 2.31 ppb to, okay, for LOD, and then for LOQ range from 0 0.03 to 6.92 ppb respectively, and actually during the analysis, it's actually difficult to. It's actually difficult to analyze many mycotoxins because most of the method they actually determine probably maybe eight or ten. So with me, I was actually working with twenty-four mycotoxins, and I actually re re reduced to twenty-one mycotoxins because some of the mycotoxin when I was preparing the martinis, it was actually giving me problems. So I reduced to twenty-one mycotoxins, and the LOD and LOQ for so can range from. 0 0.01 to 6.92 and for LOQ 
from 0 0.02 to 20.78 ppb. So if I can just go back to my table here, the highest, um, the highest LOQ is actually this one for aflat uh, for medicine B1. So the reason being being high is because um, okay, let me just go back to this um, graph to this chromatogram. So the retention time of uh, aflat uh, of medicine B1, B2, and B3 they are almost the same, but uh, FB2 is actually a loot. <laughs> it's actually it's actually a lute. Okay, I'm almost done. Okay, feminism B2 is actually a lute before feminism B, feminism B3. So there was actually a high signal to noise between feminism B1 and feminism B3. Okay. Okay. I analyzed uh, 65 samples. And I found that um, 2 to 83 percent were positive. In which you can see from this table, uh, the highest contaminate, the highest mycotoxin that was found in my sample, it was tenazonic acid, which is 83 percent. And if you can check in um, most most most, cons most consumed food, they hardly they hardly detect tenazonic acid, and which is also toxic. And it brings us to it brings us our attention to tenazonic is because it also has the carcinogenic characteristic of causing cancer. So we can also shift our focus from, not actually shift, but then add to those that are actually mostly detected like aflatoxin or cryptoxin and also include tenozoic acid. And followed by, um, followed by, okay, okay followed by uh, this alpha zia, it's alpha zia, and then uh, FB1 also. So, in conclusion, in conclusion, I will say that it is important for us to to detect and quantify mycotoxin, not actually checking a certain range, but then also checking different types of mycotoxin, mycotoxin because there's actually more than 500 mycotoxin that has been discovered since 1962, and. From the place that I sampled, since there was an outbreak of uh, listeriosis, the counselor in that paper actually once called me. She, he said that, uh, it, actually, Shendu, thank you for coming to make us aware of this mycotoxin because it will also help us to improve the way we handle food and all that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, yes, so I think... That was good work. I already did see the samples from urine, and uh, anyway, we will talk about it later. <laughs> and how? <laughs> so uh, let, let's welcome. Oh, I always use this red light. Once it has come up, so no more talks. Uh, I will. I will have developed a good way. So presenters beware. <laughs> okay, Brian. Uh, I know you have been waiting. Um, is Brian ready? Yeah, I'm told it is ready, Brian. Um, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, most of the presentations you've been listening to, I think we're pretty sophisticated. Um, mine is going to be a little bit simpler, just in time for lunch, I guess. Um, so what I've been asked to speak on is uh, what some of the analytical methods that are out there now and what the future looks like. And so I thought I would uh, sort of start by, um, what we've been noticing is that your industry uh, or uh, the scientific methods for analyzing materials and so forth haven't really changed much in a long time. Um, and so. The typical way people have been analyzing materials has stayed pretty much the same for, for the longest time, um, with very little uh, digital methods being employed. Um, so in places where the labs are more sophisticated, of course, there's a lot more instruments uh, and materials to work with. Um, and when you get into some of the less sophisticated, uh, they're still using this and using it as a way of actually coming up with uh, good results. Um, 
So what we've done is Map Africa, which is uh, the company that I run, is that we found that there's some technologies being used in North America that are not currently being used uh, in Africa. And so we licensed these technologies so that we can at least help Africa get closer to some of the more sophisticated methods. So the system that we've been using is called the Tector B16 or the Tector PDS system. And the Tector PDS system allows us to mostly test water uh, for microbiome. Um, and that gives us uh, a lot more accurate results than what you can currently do in a lab. Uh, but that it doesn't really replace uh, the scientists in labs. Uh, it just really just uh, helps to enhance uh, what they're already doing. Um, the system itself was actually certified by AOAC um, and uh, has been sort of benchmarked against uh, current methods and um, in some cases it actually outperforms uh, your current methods that you're using. So some of the labs uh, in North America and Europe actually use our system for benchmarking what they're already doing in the labs. Um, so I'll quickly go through some of this. Uh, what makes it unique is that uh, it really takes a lot of the guesswork out of uh, the process. Uh, the cartridge already come with all of the science that's required, uh, so all the reagents are in the cartridge. So all the user has to do is add water and uh, run the test. Uh, and so that really allows for a lot of opportunities for labs uh, and also extending some of the reach that the labs have. Uh, so the system itself, what really makes it unique is that um, it's, it takes a test that would normally take between 24 and 72 hours and turns it into a 12 hour test. Uh, so it makes it really rapid. I think we can actually do the test in a much, much quicker way, but because it's EPA approved, it has to run for a minimum of 12 hours, which is what it runs. But what the system also does is, at any time that it detects something, it sends out an email. So at two hours, at an hour, it sends out a result. So if there's any action that needs to be taken, it can be taken immediately. Uh, and so, in terms of the topic that was given today, uh, in terms of what the future looks like, so we, we ran a test uh, with uh, UNGEMI, Water Authority here in South Africa. And after doing the test, uh, the first thing that came back was that the system is quite accurate. Uh, but what was interesting was that because it's simple to use, they're actually going to try and put this, uh, the uh, testing units, the actual B16, closer to the source of where the samples are coming from. Um, so what that means is in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, you can have at all the various locations. So they have about uh, 13 dams that they test. They have uh, uh, 11 water treatment sites uh, and five wastewater treatment sites. So they're actually going to put the systems at all those sites. And then they will have an additional two systems that will be at the lab. So the, that, what that would uh, do is that when the samples are normal, they would not need to go to the lab. But if, they, if there is something that seems abnormal in the test, then they would go to the lab. Uh, so that really just helps to accelerate the process. Uh, and in terms of what um, I think the future looks like, so I'm not a scientist myself, um, I'm a designer. And so I generally spend a lot of time just with looking at what the future looks like, uh, which is what I normally do. And so one of the areas we work in um, is um, on the web side of things, uh, mobile development and so forth. So, so some of the things we're working on on the mobile side is that we're now able to do more with mobile technology than we've ever been able to, to do. And because of that, uh, we're starting to integrate the technology of the B16, which is basically just testing water uh, and sending the results. But as we were talking to some of the clients, one of the biggest challenges they have is actually not being able to audit whether the actual sample that was delivered came from the particular location. So that has been a, a huge, huge problem. So what we're starting to do now is uh, using a system called Trotrex. We are starting to, uh, so the, the way the system works is you give it to a user, uh, and it uh, checks their movements and checks their location. So when they take a sample, 
it automatically takes that sample by that location and by that number. So we're able to actually tell where the sample was taken, was it at that particular location, and it, it also um, it checks the time when that was done. Uh, so it, it really just allows us to at least keep the people that are collecting the samples honest. Um, and so as I was looking at uh, the way, so this is from a, um, a survey that was run by um, the United Nations World Health in uh, Ethiopia just to test if water is uh, sufficient and um, adequate for human consumption. And so they sent people to various villages. I think it took them about three months uh, to do that survey. Uh, and in that survey, they used uh, very rudimentary methods to try and collect samples and so forth. So I think in the end, they co collected about 4,000 samples uh, of drinking water. And then they collected another 4,000 samples of um, raw water. And out of that, they were able to determine what needs to be done. And that whole process took them about three months to do. And using our, the newer methods that are out there, um, I think that process could have been done in a couple of weeks and uh, produced more results with more samples. Um, so, so in essence, I think that really allows for a lot of opportunities. But as you start to to look deeper into into the future in terms of what is possible, so when you start to look at um, um, the use of uh, bots, for example, uh, to in order to help with some of the testing. So, for example, if a test came from one location and said uh, this sample has got issues. Imagine if that whole process of actually triggering further tests could be automated and automatically send messages to all the people involved and get them to, to react. And so some of these technologies exist, uh, but currently in your space, uh, none of these technologies are currently in use. So I think, in my view, that's what uh, the future of uh, analytics is going to look like. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot, I mean, Africa, we have the advantage of having uh, the most sophisticated mobile technology um, uh, compared to everybody else in the world. And because of that, there are some things that we can do in Africa now that we're not currently doing uh, that would really improve your processes of collecting samples, of collecting data and sharing that data, and even analyzing the data and uh, collecting that information. So right now, I know Amazon is exploring the opportunity of delivering packages, for example, uh, by drone. Um, and so they sort of zip lines is already delivering blood samples, for example, and blood transfusion to all the various locations by drone. And so when you take that into, into consideration uh, for your space, imagine a scenario where a sample doesn't, we don't have to wait for a sample for a week or a month. Uh, a, that sample can be delivered almost instantaneously and those results can be analyzed immediately. And if you're using, say, the system that we have, the Tector PBS, you could probably do that by ensuring that all the various locations have the samples because it sends a message immediately. So as soon as a sample is uh, tested, if uh, there's a positive result, that result can be immediately transmitted to all the key people involved that can actually react or respond to that issue. And so uh, that's, that's what I think the, I guess, the future for what you're doing looks like. And so, in short, thank you. Thank you, Bren. Bren, you can have some questions. I'm always uh, very just. Yeah, <laughs> very just. You keep time, I give you questions. <laughs> uh, thank you, Bright. Uh, but with regard to water, I, I, I see your equipment is still testing just the, uh, uh, what you used to look at. But now I think one of the challenges that we have with water is what we call uh, emerging uh, pathogens. So there is a need actually to look at other things like viruses and bacteria because we, we now see that there's quite a, a lot of those in water uh, in combination with the uh, Imaging contaminants, the chemicals, uh, is affecting the the way the way the waste water treatment plants are are behaving. Okay. So, what do you see as your developers that are developing this uh, on the spot? Um, 
analysis? Do you see them moving into a bacteria, for example, or well, all these other pathogens? Well, our system right now, the Texas D16, I think, um, I believe is the only um, automated uh, microbial uh, detecting system uh, that exists uh, for, for <laughs> I, I know they, they I mean, uh, somebody said to me the other day that maybe if I say 400 mil, okay. um, so, so, the, um, and so it's, it's, it's extremely effective for testing E. coli uh, intracoccus, uh, total coliform and fecal yeah. coliform. And so those we can test. Uh, and as I was talking to the manufacturers, they're working on a few other things, uh, but they're not doing any chemical testing yet. Yeah, I mean, there's also a coliminder that is doing something similar to that. And our, our challenge to them is that can we extend it beyond what we are looking at right now? Was the one to be able to look at the other pathogens? Yeah. Okay. No, they, they are definitely looking at that. Uh, wh what they're doing right now is they're working on a few other tests that would be uh, available soon. Uh, unfortunately, they're not ready. The only ones that are ready are those four at the moment. Great. Any other? And I may allow, even if you had a question for the other two presenters, I will allow two questions. To him. Thank, thank you, MC. Thank you for that expose, uh, Livingston from Zimbabwe. Uh, what would you say about uh, security concerns on the future of the sampling technique, you say, the mobile technology, the drones, as they are flying these samples to add to rich areas in particular? and then uh, the security thereof. And uh, also, uh, any comment about the integrity of the suicide samples as they are in transit? Well, um, right now, I mean, the, the last two that I put in are really just uh, what I think the future looks like uh, myself. I think security is always an issue when you send something by any method, really. Um, but in terms of um, what I actually see being almost the immediate thing is uh, a scenario where, say, um, in Zimbabwe, as you're saying, uh, in some of the rural settings, um, say, at a public health center, having an actual testing unit there, uh, closer to the source of where the tests uh, are being collected, I see that being uh, something that happens more immediately. And when you take mobile technology which is actually available everywhere. That means we can we will be able to send the results immediately to whoever needs those results. So the authorities to the people who need to actually respond and react to that. I see that being something that is almost immediate and that's already available. Uh, the sending of samples in that scenario would not be as necessary if the samples are being collected right there. Uh, but in a scenario where a sample needs to be sent immediately, the drone uh, becomes the most viable way to do it, uh, especially like I used an example of, um, of uh, KwaZulu-Natal, which is very hilly uh, landscape. That means if you're going to drive that same sample, you will not be able to get there in good time. So I think I see that being uh, almost like a mixture of solutions, uh, but security is always an issue in any given scenario. Great. Um, any, no more questions for Brian, so that I release him from the podium. For him. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, my name is Renatus from Namibia. I only wanted to find out how expensive that equipment and uh, how can the cost of maintenance. Okay, purchasing and the maintenance, um, especially in the chemicals if they are needed, if they want to use for a very long time. Yeah, so I think it's very cost effective um, and so the machine itself uh, costs uh, 21,000 US dollars uh, for the machine. Uh, the cartridges are 11 US dollars uh, for the cartridges. So what does that look like compared to the current system? So at Ungeni, when they ran their numbers, they see that solution actually saves them 70% of their budget. 
if they were to adopt that. Um, what we're exploring, uh, their biggest challenge is, so if they wanted to buy 11 machines, um, and then they have to buy another five for the, all the treatment plants they have. That's that's a huge budget. So that's going to take a while for them to ensure that every single location has a machine. Um, and so that's what they presented to us. And so in return, what we said was that we would be happy to give them the machines as long as they commit to buying a certain number of cartridges, uh, which allows them to be able to actually do that immediately. Uh, because really the true value of the process is actually in the cartridges and the tests that come out of it. So if we're looking at a scenario like that, you're looking at maybe cartridges costing about 25 US dollars as opposed to 11, which covers the cost of uh, everything else, giving the cartridge and uh, giving the system and everything. So when you look at that, when you consider that currently in South Africa, I think it tests uh, if you are buying from a um, from a testing lab, costs about 150 US dollars. So when you compare the two, even for the labs themselves, it's an advantage to have a machine like that in place, so they can have rapid tests that give people results in 12 hours or less, uh, but also allow them to actually do it in a more cost-effective way uh, with less errors. Okay. So, okay, Brian, I think. I know it was not for Brian. Not for Brian, it was yeah. for oh? It was for uh, Dr. Lamini. Ah, you want to, to ask for Lamini? If I may. Okay. okay. Brian, you are done. Thank you very much. Mm. So I'll take a few for the other presenters okay. so that we, we move forward. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, just wanted to uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. Lamini, um, because referring back to the uh, presentations given by Dr. Morira and um, uh, Dr. Babarinde, um, would uh, CSIR perhaps maybe, uh, if um, uh, you know uh, the need exists, be open to be to be able to collaborate? Uh, to, to um, establish um, studies that has been actually indicated that um, are lacking and needed in terms of like um, profiling um, indigenous foods for nutritious value, chemistry and so on. That's just a question. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask yeah, you can do quickly. <laughs> yes, of course we can collaborate. Like I indicated, we work across Africa and we're always on the lookout for partners who are willing to work with us. Thank you for that question. And of course, we normally have many South African products. And now in Kenya, those traditional vegetables are more expensive. I'm surprised you are saying your people are not taking them seriously. So you can bring them to Kenya. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Valerie Mukoya. I'm a doctoral student at the University of Johannesburg, supervised by Professor Angila and uh, Professor, supervised by Professor Nangongo as a co-supervisor. And I'll be speaking on the analysis of multi-class organic contaminants in wastewater using LCMS. Um, so the occurrence of organic pollutants in water bodies is of great concern uh, to the human population, to ecosystems, and also to our economies. So some of these organic contaminants, uh, as can be seen on the screen, include polyaromatic hydrocarbons, pesticides, pharmaceuticals, and personal care products. And we also have secondary contamination uh, from uh, disinfection byproducts that occur in wastewater treatment plants. Um, so really, the problem is that the wastewater treatment plants are trying their best to remove these organic contaminants from the wastewater before they're discharged into the water system, such as rivers, lakes. However, they are not able to remove them completely and they're still found persisting in the environment. And we know that these contaminants, when they are exposed to the environment, they are from poorly treated um, wastewater, they get back into the water cycle and you can find those contaminants in your drinking water or the water that is used for agriculture and it, it, the residues can end up in the food that we eat as well. 
and because of their mutagenic and carcinogenic properties, they can lead to detrimental health effects such as formation of cancer. So for my work, normally uh, for the experimental work, we sample the water from the wastewater treatment plant because I'm focusing on wastewater. Then we analyze them using uh, various extraction techniques. Uh, Professor Dube mentioned uh, quite a variety of techniques yesterday. And for my work, for this one, I'll be using solid phase extraction. And for the solid phase extraction optimization, I use design of experiments using Statistica and Minitab softwares. Thereafter, um, in conjunction with analysis uh, using LCM SMS, and then you analyze and interpret the data. So why I choose to do multivariate optimization is because it allows for interaction among variables, and unlike doing one variable at a time, and it gives a holistic knowledge of the domain. You have smaller experiments, and it improves the quality of experiments. So the steps to do that is um, you have to decide on the variables that you want to investigate, and the levels of the variables that you have chosen to investigate, the dependent variables, and then you apply the appropriate model uh, for your experimental plan using the factorial design or uh, using the first order or second order factorial design, and then you analyze it, the data obtained. So for my solid phase extraction, I am using, this time around, I'm using a carbon-based nanomaterials. And unlike, um, I was doing this one because in our university, Applied Chemistry, it's a center for nanotechnology. So I decided to use carbon nanomaterials for, um, for this work for my sample extraction procedure. And for this work, we synthesized carbon, nano, carbon nanodots from oats. And for, for this procedure, so you have 10 grams of the oats blended finely, and then you, have, you put it in the crucible, pyrolyze it uh, for 400, at 400 degrees Celsius for two hours in a muffled furnace. Thereafter, after cooling, you disperse it in ultra-pure water to remove the larger particles. And then, um, before that, you actually, after, after pyrolyzing in the muffled furnace, you grind it, after cooling, you grind it, um, you grind it into fine powder. That is how you get the carbon nanodots. And then you disperse it in ultra-pure water and to remove the larger particles. And then after centrifuging, you dry them for, you dry the obtained product for 24 hours at 80 degrees Celsius. And then you obtain your products. So the advantages of using nanomaterials is that they are cost effective. They have a large surface area for absorption. So it increases the extractability. They are reusable. And they are selective. They can be functionalized. And um, they are rapid. For example, if you functionalize it and to make it, for example, magnetic, you can use a magnetic solid phase extraction, which is really quite rapid. And hence, you are able to shorten the analysis time and save on a lot of costs. For the uh, instrumentation part, I use LCM SMS. That is the instrument that we have in our laboratory. It's an Xera uh, UHPLC MS, MS 8040. And uh, so these are the conditions, the column, the flow rate, and the mobile phase. And so for the LCMS, before you go anywhere, you have to get the MS parameters. So I, I so much appreciate uh, this instrument because it has a very nice functionality called optimization for method. What you do is you just, you obviously have your molecular weight, you just feed it on the, on the software and uh, it runs, you, you set it up to run in a positive mode or negative mode, it will choose for you the most sensitive parameters. And it gives you all these uh, MRM parameters for multiple reaction monitoring, for the precursor ion and for the product ions, because this is what is needed for quantification. And uh, for the product, precursor ion and the product ions are used for identification of the compounds. So it's very, very fast. You can develop a lot of methods in a very short time. And for that, I really give credit to Ushmat. So for the characterization of my carbon nanodots, we use um, selected, uh, we use scanning mi uh, electron microscope for investigating the morphology of the carbon nanomaterials, and we use uh, transmission electron microscopy for 
uh, checking the structure, the normal structure of the carbon nanodrops. So as you can see in image A, sorry. as you can see in image A, uh, it shows the carbon nano-like structure of the carbon nanodots. It confirms it. And the image B, you can see the, the morphology of the carbon nanodots. So these are my preliminary experiments because the work is still ongoing. And for my factual, for my design of experiments, I'm using response surface methodology based on carbon central composite design. So over here, I have the experimental plan. So the variables that I, I am uh, that I was investigating were pH, uh, mass of the adsorbent, that is the carbon, carbon nanodots, and in milligrams, and the emission volume. So these carbon nanodots are packed in empty SPE frits, and uh, that's how you do the SPE, uh, using a VC prep uh, semi-automated um, uh, solid phase extraction. So I was varying uh, three variables, and I have uh, quite a number of runs. So when you put it on the software, it gives you this experimental run. You go and run the experiments, and then you'll be able to get your results based on the recoveries. So these are my recoveries. After you obtain these recoveries, you put them on a Minitab software. Minitab software is fantastic. It is able to give you the optimum conditions for this analyze at once. And the optimum conditions that I got using Minitab were pH4, mass of 170, and an emission volume of 6. So this is what I used to carry on with the um, validation and uh, method performance. So far, I have managed to conduct the method accuracy and recovery in two matrices, the wastewater, um, it's wastewater, so two different matrices. So there's efflet wastewater and there's efflet wastewater. So I was using one of the tools that we have learned and that have been used in uh, performing uh, method validation is spike recoveries. So I spike uh, the effluent, the, the, the real water sample, at two levels, at 10 and 100 ppb, for the six analysts that I'm analyzing, uh, which is the method, the parabens and the, the organophosphorus. So from these results, you can see that um, the, the recoveries for the influent wastewater uh, were ranging uh, from 45 to 87. They were slightly lower. This matrix is not as easy as the effluent wastewater, which was giving uh, recoveries of 75 to 120%, uh, but both of them had low uh, RSDs of less than 10%. So this is as far as I've reached. When I go back to the lab today, I will continue with the rest of the experiments, which include the interday, interday, the LOD and the LO, LOQ, sorry, for that I, read, I wrote LOD twice, the trueness, the matrix effect, and just for curious, curiosity sake, and also just to compare with the commercial based, commercially based um, cartridges such as the Oasis HLB, which are always used, I will do a comparison of my carbon nanodots with, um, with the commercially based carbon, uh, with the commercially based SP cartridges, and then also look at the reusability of my material. So this is an example of a total iron chromatogram that I of the spiked water sample at the level of 10 ppb. In conclusion, um, for for the fact I've come in, my, in this in this uh, experiment is that we developed a novel method based on uh, carbon uh, based on materials for the extraction as an SP solvent for the development of an optimization of parabens and organochlorine. Organophosphorus pesticides for, in, for the determination in wastewater. Uh, green synthesis of carbon nanodots was employed for the preparation of this nanomaterial. And the SPE based carbon nanodots uh, was optimized multivariately to give the optimum experimental conditions. And for this results, as you have, as you have seen, uh, we got recoveries ranging between 45 to 87 and for effluent wastewater and um, for effluent wastewater and 75 to 120% for effluent wastewater. Uh, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the University of Johannesburg Water Research Commission, which is sponsoring uh, my PhD, and the AOC International. I want to um, 
really, really appreciate uh, being invited to come and be part of this inaugural meeting because you can only make a difference by an, an impact by engaging. And also by, if you just sit in the lab and do the, the instructions and develop methods and not knowing what is required or needed out there, then you don't really become relevant. So I'm really very grateful to be invited to speak here and to see what is going on and to align myself with the, with the new um, plans moving forward in the analytical association uh, uh, group. I also want to thank, thank Microsoft for the funding to attend this meeting. Thank you very much. Good. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, please welcome back to the seat. I will come back to you just in case because I have a red line. Good afternoon, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, standing before you is uh, Saber Tamani um, from NMISA. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm here to present to you uh, the project or uh, and, and, uh, method that we are currently developing in our lab, which is uh, based on um, quantification of amino acids in infant formula using a gc ms method, or as most of us might call it, it's gas chromatography, time of flight, mass spectrometry system. Uh, we believe that this method could serve as a, a useful alternative to the methods that are, are currently available in the market. Um, we hope that by the time when we are done, uh, we have completely or successfully uh, validated and um, uh, validated it and we will be able to use it as an alternative uh, for our, our current uh, methods. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know that um, Proteins are by far one of the most important uh, macromolecules in, in, in food or uh, food components in here for, feed for especially for infants, because of the role that these micromolecules play in human growth and development um, and in prevention of diseases. As you know, that uh, uh, severe deficiencies of these macromolecules may lead to conditions such as kwashioko, marasmus, or death if, uh, these, if these conditions are not treated. So it is therefore important for us to develop methods for both qualitative and quantitative analysis of proteins in order to ensure that all the infant food formula or infant food stuff meets the, the standards that have been set globally by the Codex Alimentarius um, Commission. And, in also, and also to ensure that we, we, we prevent uh, food adulteration, such as, the, uh, such as the melamine adulteration that happened in, in China in 2008. So we also have to develop methods in order to make sure that we protect consumers against the falsified claims of nutrients that are, are done by uh, our manufacturers. So um, prior to the incident, that melamine incident that happened in China in 2008, uh, two methods were accredited by the AOAC uh, as, as, as the go-to methods for analysis of protein in food and other matrices. Those are the Kajal method and the, the Damas method. The Kajal method is based on uh, use of samples. Uh, that, the problem with the, the Kajal method was that uh, large samples are required to, to analyze um, or to quantify amino acids or proteins uh, to be specific. And it used uh, toxic, uh, toxic uh, chemicals such as mercury in order to, to quantify that. But then the Damas method was a better alternative because it offered, it only used combustion, so you don't need to, to use um, chemicals in order to, to, to quantify the protein. But the shortcoming of both of these methods was that um, they are all based on um, uh, nitrogen, total, quantity, to, total nitrogen content in the sample. And that, um, with that said, this uh, uh, raises an issue with respect to the presence of, of non proteogenic uh, nitrogen in the sample. So these methods failed to, to, actually, to actually distinguish between the proteinogenic and non proteinogenic uh, um, nitrogen in the sample. So, which means we had to find uh, viable alternatives. So, uh, with this uh, problem, uh, HPLC based methods became uh, very dominant. Uh, so, however, 
with the uh, rise of these new methods, another issue, other issues came up like complex matrix challenges mm -hmm. and the need for theoretizing agents. Sometimes you have to, if you are using OPA and FMO, for instance, we have to uh, use both uh, reagents in order to be able to quantify both primary and secondary amino acids. And uh, the poor stability of the derivatives that were formed when we are using OPA and PITC and sometimes the coalitions that could not be resolved also became an issue. But the light came at the end of the tunnel with the introduction of the AQC method. Uh, this method has been mastered by Waters with the introduction of uh, the AQC um, kit which is known as architect or that's how we call it in our With this one you can uh, do a quick derivatization with uh, using only one reagent. This is this takes like uh, 10 minutes and it's uh, it gives good stability of the derivatives and then it also gives you a short analysis time because the analysis time is about 10 minutes. However, being in Africa means there are a lot of challenges when it comes to uh, our laboratories. Um, they are not well equipped. Sometimes you might not have uh, an LC to, to, to do this uh, analysis on. So we definitely have to find alternative ways or alternative methods to, um, to, to perform this uh, analysis because it's, it's one of the important analyses that we have to, to do. So this is the reason why we, we, we try to come up with a, an alternative method that we believe might be an, an, a, a useful alternative if you not having an LC, but you do have a GC or something like that. So in my, uh, in my talk, I'll try to cover these uh, uh, following uh, aspects, because there was a call by the AOAC in 2015 for the development of uh, methods for quantification of amino acids in, in, in infant food. I will try to explain why we, like I have said already, that it is important that we develop alternative methods, so it's, that's why we, we are using the gc -TOF. And I will try to cover um, shortly the, the, the method development and the results, then I will conclude. So in uh, 2015, the AOC uh, made a call for development of methods for, um, for analysis of amino acids in infant formula. The method performance requirements were stipulated in the AOC call, were as follows for, this is basically based on uh, the analysis of reconstituted powdered milk. So the parameters were the calibration range that was required was between 0 0.4 nanogram milligrams per gram to 2,500 milligrams per 100 grams. I mean, um, and the limit of quantification should be anything less than um, 0 0.4 milligrams per 100 grams, and the recovery that is expected is between 80 and 110 percent, with a reproducibility of less than uh, 15 percent. So, um, as I said, uh, already mentioned this, that this is very important for us to also find an alternative. So, the reason why we believe that uh, the GCT of MS uh, can work, um, it's already been used in different, as in, in different places where it is used as an alternative uh, to an LC, in cases where the LC is not available. But it's, it, uh, uh, as we know, it might not be applicable to all uh, matrices and the this of can uh, detect analytes at a, a PCOM region. Uh, it could be used if you have uh, a GC12 and an LC, you could use them uh, concurrently to confirm your results, maybe that you got using a, a, a UPLC system. And, and this instrument also has, or the software has the peak diff convolution. Uh, um, Capability, so you could be able to quantify two analysts that are, are coeluting if they are uh, resolved by a peak deconvolution. And with this method, you can use a relatively cheaper uh, derivatizing agent, which is MTPSTFA, which is easily available. You can get it cheaper, especially here in South Africa. So, with our method. Uh, we developed a, a speed optimized flow rate method for, for this analysis. Um, as you can see from uh, my uh, figure there, that those are the parameters that we, 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 we based our methods on. But then I won't dwell on them because of, of, of time. 
So uh, using this speed optimized flow rate method, we are able to actually uh, resolve all amino acids in the taurine within 12.5 minutes with the only co-elution that was between uh, onethine and uh, methionine sulfone. But as we can also see from the, from the uh, figure, that the onothene and the methionine sulfone could still be, de um, be, be resolved by deconvolution as, they, as their peaks impacts at uh, different retention times. So uh, our method was able to actually separate uh, our analytes. Um, our linearity, based on the, on, the, on the calibration range that was required, the linearity that we got for external calibration and um, for isotope dilution methods were, between, were, were, were closer to one. So we were happy about that. But uh, the problem was that we were having a, a big RSDs because of um, what I will try to explain now. Uh, as most of people who work with uh, protein analysis or who do acid hydrolysis on protein will understand that the key to um, correct quantification lies on, um, on, on the hydrolysis part of the things. Because in, if there's oxygen present in, in, your, in your hydrolysis tube, then you'll, you'll be, uh, you, you, your, 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 your quantification will tend to have some uh, bias, mostly negative, because they, they, some of the compounds will be degrading to, during the hydrolysis, which is performed over 24 hours. So we believe that uh, because we did not at the time have a proper system to work out all the oxygen that is present in the samples, so that was a part of uh, why big RSTs. So, uh, so okay, I'm just going to So we, we recently developed, designed this uh, um, tool that we will be using to, to that we, we think would be uh, good for automated um, hydrolysis or vacuuming of the, of the oxygen out of the chest tubes, of, of the hydrolysis tubes. So the recovery is that, or the LOQs that we got were well within what the, the AOC has uh, specified, except for some, such as uh, tyrosine, uh, theonine, and proline, and aspartic acid when you are using an isotope dilution method. Yeah, so, and the recoveries were, we, were between 63 and 121%, and 73, uh, between 73 and 123% for isotope dilution. And we, we believe that is, uh, for now, it's good enough why, why we still improving our method. And based on um, uncertainty of our measurement, we, sh we, we can show that uh, the, our, our, our results were either in including the value, the true value of, uh, of, of the, the SRM, as you can see there. Um, so uh, I can then conclude that I believe that our, our method will be a good alternative, of course, for once it's uh, fully developed and, and validated. And only, uh, only, as you saw, that only a few analysts that were out completely that differ significantly from the true values that were specified in the SRM. And yeah, further improvements of the coefficient operation are still required as we, we, we have to go forward, as I showed you um, now that we have now this de designed a, a tool that we believe that will allow us to automate the vacuuming, system, the vacuuming of the oxygen out of uh, uh, our hydrolysis tubes. I would like to thank um, NMISA and the University of Pretoria for uh, working with me on this project. And I thank uh, NMISA for, for um, finding the, the project and, and, and being there during the time of need. Thank you. Good, 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 good. Thank you very much for that presentation learning. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As I've been introduced, I'm Mahadi Matasako from the NMISA, and I'm going to be in, um, presenting to you my master's project, which is titled The Total Analysis and Speciation of Arsenic 
in South African food products, mainly wheat flour, but and chromatography coupled to high resolution ICPMS. So this is just a basic overview of my presentation. I'll be taking you through um, the introduction, aims and objectives, the total arsenic analysis, the speciation analysis, conclusions, and then the acknowledgements. So um, arsenic is a metal, well, a semi-metal that's um, found almost everywhere in the environment, and it's so it's found in your air, the water, and the soil, and subsequently finds itself in the food that you consume. Apart from it being, um, well, apart from it na uh, naturally occurring in the environment, it is also introduced into the environment by anthropogenic activities, mainly in your agricultural, in the agricultural industry, where um, it's usually used. Arsenic-based um, fertilizers and pesticides are usually used, and it's also found in the mining industry during smelting operations, um, burning of fossil fuels, and also during um, industrial um, waste. So arsenic enters the body through um, ingestion, which is the most common way of entry. So ingesting arsenic contaminated water or food, and also inhalation and general contact from picking arsenic, um, well, picking rice in arsenic contaminated waters. And these um, um, are usually, arsenic is usually associated with a lot of health effects um, like cancer and also skin lesions, as you can see here. So there have been standards and regulations that have been put into place for um, the max, well, the limits of arsenic in food products and drinking water. The EPA and the World Health Organization have um, a maximum limit of 10 ppb in drinking water and in food products, um, the FDA has limits between 500 and 2,000 ppb depending on the kind of food and the EU as well between 100 ppb and 300 ppb depending on the kind of rice as stipulated in the... So South Africa relies a lot on staple food products for food security as I think has been mentioned a lot in this um, inaugural meeting. We depend a lot on maize and wheat flour, which are the country's largest locally um, produced field crops, which serve as an important source of carbohydrates in many, many households. Rice, on the other hand, is not um, locally cultivated, but we do import most of our rice from um, Asian countries. And in fact, South Africa is ranked as one of the highest um, or the world's leading rice importing countries. So not all forms of arsenic are toxic to the human body. Um, it's mainly your inorganic arsenic, which is your arsenic-3 and arsenic-5, which are highly toxic. You have your methylated forms of arsenic, MMA and DMA, which are less toxic. You also have other forms such as arsenobetaine and arsenicoline, which is mostly found in fish, but those are very, uh, not very harmful. This has prompted a need for us to perform speciation analysis in order to distinguish between um, the toxic inorganic arsenic from the less toxic organic forms of arsenic. This has led to the aim of my study, which is to determine the total content of arsenic, as well as the arsenic species in wheat flour using iron chromatography coupled to ICPMS. And to do this, I'm gonna develop a procedure for the microwave-assisted digestion and determination of total arsenic content in wheat flour and analyze using ICPMS and then develop an efficient procedure for the extraction, separation, identification, and quantification of intact species, arsenic species in wheat flower samples by ion chromatography, ICPMS, with the key word being intact arsenic species. So for the total arsenic, we did, a di um, we did four digestion procedures to find um, the optimum one, and Digestion method one and two involve digesting with eight milliliters of nitric acid and 40 microliters of peroxide. And it's 180 degrees Celsius for method one and 120 degrees Celsius for method two. And these are the recoveries um, that we got for both methods. Then we decided to eliminate um, the use of peroxide and use four milliliters of nitric acid and four milliliters of water for method three and we digested it in the microwave at 110 degrees Celsius, and we got this these good recoveries. 
But the issue with method three is that not all your sample was, well, not all of the sample was completely digested, and you still had quite a few solid particles in the digestion. So um, that would be a problem when we have to analyze using ICPMS. Then we went to method four, where we used just six milliliters of nitric acid with no water or no peroxide, and we got very good recoveries of 105 and 88% on two reference materials, the nest rice flour and a wheat flour reference material from China. Okay, that was the method that we then opted for, optimal method for the digestion. And then um, in the lab, we usually use um, nitric acid for digesting most of our samples, and we also use it for preserving our, sample, our samples. And nitric acid is actually a good um, well, it's compatible with ICPMS because it introduces very minimal interferences into the, into the instrument. So, essentially, we're going to use nitric acid for, um, for an analyzing our, um, our samples. But we noticed that the more, the more nitric acid that you have in the sample, you'll have a decrease in the sensitivity of your instrument. And we already know that in wheat flour, the arsenic concentrations are already very low, so we can't afford to have very. Um, we can't have. We can't afford to have the instrument very well, not very sensitive. So to increase the sensitivity of our instrument, so that we could read our samples just a little bit above the detection limit, we um, decided to investigate the use of different alcohol, different alcohols, not the drinking alcohol. Um, so isopropanol, methanol, and ethanol um, to increase the sensitivity of the instrument. And as you can see, the more alcohol you have in the sample, then the, um, the intensity or the sensitivity of the instrument increases. We then went forth to calculate the detection limits and the sensitivity for, our, for the three alcohols and the nitric acid. And we can clearly see that ethanol here gives the lowest detection limit, which is good, and it gives the highest sensitivity. So we opted for that one. We then um, ran repeatability studies on um, this dry flower CRM, and we got um, very good um, percent, well, not very good, but relatively good percentage RSD. And the mean value of our CRM was comparable with the, ref with the reference material and we calculated that using the EN score. And because it's below one, then it's acceptable. Then we did a um, within laboratory precision or intermediate precision or within laboratory reproducibility. Um, on, our t uh, on our 10 um, samples, wheat flour samples, we ran these over, well, Three, on three different digestions, three different days, and these were the percentage RSDs that we got for that. And then with that, we did um, um, recoveries using the NIST rice flour, A and B, and we got good recoveries for that. Then we went forth and um, analyzed our samples. With this run, we also ran a reference material and got good recoveries, about 98%. So for the speciation studies, the, well, the extraction method was very similar to the digestion method, except that we ran it at a, well, we did the microwave extraction at a lower temperature, at 95 degrees Celsius, and at a lower, well, for a shorter period of time. We then did, um, we then separated the, okay, so these are the four, the four um, arsenic species that we, re we expect in our wheat flour samples, and we managed to completely separate all four of them mm -hmm. using um, a gradient elution, so 0 0.5 ppb, and I mean, yeah, 0 0.5 millimolar and 50 millimolar, the flow rate of 0 0.2 in 18 minutes. Okay, I'm going to have to rush because it seems like my time's running out. Um, then we um, did a nitric acid extraction 
and we saw that there was no MMA that was seen in the samples and we had quite good recoveries for those. Then we extracted in water, because the point of my, of my project was to keep the samples intact, we decided to then extract in water, and there you can see the NIST rice flour does have a certified value for MMA, although the recovery was very low because it's in water. Um, the NMIJ doesn't have um, value for MMA, and the ERM does not report a value for um, MMA, but we do get some of MMA in the sample. We then decided to do a standard edition, but um, it wasn't very successful. Something really just happens when you add um, well, your spiking solution to the samples, and you get these funny looking peaks here. We then did an LOQ and LOD, and we saw that we get very with sub PPD um, LODs. And we did a repeatability as well, and we got um, very low, well, low RSDs, except for MMA, which reads very close to the detection limit. We did a within laboratory reproducibility as well, and also got um, these RSDs with arsenic 5 and MMA having high RSDs for the nest rice flower. Okay, I'd like to conclude by saying that we did, um, we had a successful microwave digestion with a, with a temperature range between 95 to 110 degrees Celsius and just using nitric acid as a solvent for wheat flour. Um, the presence of 5% alcohol provides a significant increase in the sensitivity as you've seen in the graphs. The method was validated using the NIST CRM 1568A and B, and the use of a graded flow mobile phase showed good separation and well-defined peak shapes. A solvent extraction using water was, the, was what we opted for, and we optimized for arsenic um, speciation. The, this shows that the method also allows for subparts per billion limits of detection for all the measured arsenic species. The implementation of the optimized separation method um, will be applied to um, our, the real wheat flour samples, and that's still in progress. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge NEMISA, University of Johannesburg, and the NRA for the uh, um, opportunity to do my studies and for them for funding me. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, please uh, welcome. Sure. Uh, the congregation. Uh, I think we. Is it congregation? This is a congregation. Now, uh, yeah, you can you can imagine. Uh, I am somehow a preacher. So, all right. Now our time is spent. We were supposed to stop at what time? One fifteen, as per the program. But because 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 we have gone up to one twenty, I think we can just finish, right? I am right to finish. So um, allow me to finish this session. It was a long one, but I want to thank you for uh, being up. Uh, I haven't seen somebody sleeping uh, or dozing, so that means we are all. Uh, uh, before Owen comes. We have something to do as board members. And because he's the leader of all that you've seen, we call him up and we just want to give him a, a small present. So, oh, he doesn't like that. But I have to be sure of it. And there it goes. Wait, and then take a picture. Mr. President, I don't mind. I'm speechless now. So. Thank you very much. So I 
think uh, I'm standing between I'm standing between uh, how many people? I average about uh, 80 people and lunch. So I will make this very fast, very quick one. And I've lost my words. Uh, to, to everyone uh, for staying with us for the, the three days of this meeting. Um, for me it has been a remarkable experience. I think for the team as well it has been a remarkable experience this being an all meeting. I particularly like to thank uh, the Cornet and her uh, organizing team, and Jane and her team of, uh, of very enthusiastic uh, helpers really appreciate that. I hope I've, uh, I've um, met each and every one of you individually. Um, if uh, I haven't, please, we still have a few, uh, few hours remaining and we have the reception. I've learned quite a lot um, over the last few days myself and um, we've had the opportunity as the AOAC section to, to meet and to discuss and to decide how we move forward. I'd just like to make a, just a mention of the, the support we've received from Marianne Airways International and how that has helped us to shape uh, this section and hopefully uh, shape the experience that we've had, um, that we will have going forward in building this section. I just have a couple of slides to share with you and this is uh, concerning the the, our priorities for 2019 going forward. We will, our, our priorities, priorities remain the same. We will continue to focus on uh, analytical method development, uh, harmonization and alignment. We will continue to focus on capacity building, training and education act activities. We will continue focusing on uh, improving ways of working with you to improve the lab infrastructure and of course networking and also building professionalism in, uh, in confidence and analytics. In terms of our objectives for 2019, I think we, we, uh, we like to do things ambitiously. This meeting was an ambitious plan. I think this gives us the, the confidence that uh, we, could, we could achieve these in 2019. We aim to have uh, uh, two uh, analytical methods uh, validation and verification workshops, one in Q1 and one in Q3. We aim to develop uh, a pilot train trainer program uh, with uh, collaborators, and uh, this is, we, will, we will provide you more information on this going forward. And we aim to, to uh, support four students' internship scholarships. This will enable students like the uh, like uh, we have seen in the last part of the of the presentation of this morning session, this, today's session, um, and uh, really to have to to provide experiences for and opportunities for these uh, these promising students. We will be launching uh, the analytical method uh, alignment platform, and this will be ready by two by Q1 2019. Um, for this, we, we invite other labs who uh, may wish to participate in this and sharing methods and engaging uh, on this platform. We would like to develop uh, some expert working groups for the for the uh, for the section, and also to to identify eight experts uh, to serve at AOAC international committees. There's also a call for reviews and the reviewers, and, uh, and we will, we will um, be uh, appealing to our membership uh, for those who are interested in, in, uh, in taking up this type of activity. We aim to establish two former collaborations to, to, uh, to benefit from the synergies that our organizations uh, uh, can have in serving the purpose. Uh, we, we gather for. 
and um, we are looking at the possibility of establishing a partnership scholarship fund. And this is the fund um, method development activities, method development activities um, uh, for students and members to attend meetings uh, to support also our internship programs and so on. So, lots of work to do. Uh, of course, we're, we're always uh, looking for persons to volunteer their time. This is a voluntary organization. Volunteer their time um, uh, to enrich the organization. Um, 2019, we have decided that we will have a meeting in, in Cape Town. Uh, between the 4th and the 8th of November. Uh, with this, I'd like to invite you all, and um, I sincerely hope that uh, we, we could continue to build this, uh, this, uh, this, this organization and, of course, continue to enrich it with your, with your um, attendance and support. I hope we can meet your expectations. I hope that this meeting uh, in, in have met your expectations as well. Uh, we look forward to your feedback uh, to help us to improve it in every way we can. Thank you very much and um, I know many of you travel from far. For those who are traveling from there and from far, we would like to wish you a safe return uh, to your to your to your um, destiny, to your to your homes and um, I'd also like to I'd like to really thank you again for the effort that you have put into making this what it has been for the last few days. And I can tell you, I, it has been a fantastic three days. I've met uh, many people. I've, I have quadrupled the number of friends that I have, people I can call friends as well. And um, I really feel like I'm part of, a, of an extended family. I really appreciate that as well. So, Thanks very much. Please, uh, if you have not yet joined the AOEC uh, Sub-Saharan Africa section, um, you can either go on the website or you can take some time, a few minutes in the in the war room, according to Kone, just next door, and um, they can sign you up. It's free. Please join us, and thank you very much.